at this panel today. Um, it's nice to see a kind of a community of people and individuals that are interested in talking about mental health, about digital health, and just like how the world is changing. Um, I'm glad that we could all kind of be here this Sunday morning. But yeah, I think like the best way for us to start is for everyone to kind of introduce themselves and give the panel participants a sense of like what this panel is about and who who's kind of going to be speaking today. So I can quickly give some background on my interest in mental health and what got me, what made, you know, what got me here today. So my name is Sanat Mohapatra. I am a recent graduate from Dartmouth College. I studied English and creative writing, but my interest in mental health kind of stemmed from a mobile application that I built called Unmasked, which kind of aims to provide college students with like a supportive anonymous digital community so they can kind of connect to other students in their at their school and express themselves in the context of mental health and so it's really focused on like peer support community and like mental health support but yeah I, I think it'd be helpful for everyone else to maybe give their basic introductions and then we can kind of hop into more specific questions for each of the panelists. Um, Manrup, would you want to go first? Of course. I, uh, first, I did want to appreciate, you know, this opportunity to get to speak with everyone about, you know, such a such a growing problem that every age group is facing, you know, especially um, just yesterday, I read an article that teen girls are developing tics from using TikTok. And so for those that know tics, those are like physical tremors, like, you know, shakiness or just doing abnormal, like, activities like actions um, and so that goes to show you that such popular social media platforms like TikTok, like facebook that you would think are safe are not as safe you know they're causing depression anxiety and all sorts of other problems um, so i do think that this is a growing problem and i'm glad that you know there is a community that's focused on trying to develop solutions for it. um and so with that said, just a little bit about myself and then um, what FriendMe does. Um, so I'm currently a senior finance student at Indiana University with a minor in psychology. Um, and so this, what essentially like piqued my interest in this field specific is that it's a problem that is there, but people don't really want to talk. About it. They don't feel comfortable discussing it compared to something like sports or school, which are a lot more open to talking with others about. Um, and so in essence, um, we focus like me and a group of other people that are like developers on the team, we're working on a platform called FriendMe. And so what FriendMe does is it connects you with people near you that are going through same like similar mental issues. Um, so you like put in your inputs like I have like anxiety, depression, those type of things, your age, um, like what type of other people you want to see that are like in that specific age group. <clears throat> because it's a lot more like useful for you to talk with other people that have gone through something like this or are going through it rather than like a therapist who will give you like generic type of feedback like you know just think positive like that's easy to say but it's a lot more difficult to actually like do so uh, just to keep it short and simple that, that's kind of what we're focused on thank you Manrup. um yeah excited to hear more about your work but Jada, do you want to go next and give us a bit of an introduction? Hi, my name is Jada Washington. I'm in eighth grade and I go to Sargrass Springs Middle School. And what I'd be focusing on today is about, about a year ago, I tore my ACL um, while playing soccer. And this was in the pandemic, so I didn't really have a way to outlet and communicate to other people. And gaming has really affected my mental health in a positive way for me to be able to communicate and to talk to new people and just have a community towards others. Thank you, Jada. No, excited to hear more about your thoughts on gaming and, you know, the youth. Uh, Hannah, would you want to go next? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Hannah. Um, I am a recent graduate of UIC. Um, I'm currently at Northwestern studying journalism before I go um, to med school, but my involvement with mental health kind of started uh, at UIC through student government. Um, and I kind of led the 
creation of and like the functioning of um, like a student led mental health coalition. Um, and so we did a lot of like surveying the community, um, made use of like our social and digital platforms to do that um, and kind of use that information to present it to our administrators to get them to kind of um, kickstart some of the improvements that really were necessary in order to better maintain like university student mental health. Yeah, no, that's very cool. Thank you, Hannah, for sharing a little bit about your background. Um, yeah, I guess we can kind of get into more specific questions about, you know, like what people are working on and like maybe people's interest in mental health more directly. Um, yeah, maybe we could start with Jada, if you want to tell us more about your interest in gaming, your story, and maybe like what you see as the connection between gaming and mental health. All right. So as I mentioned earlier about me tearing my ACL and me being able to find a community in gaming, um, overall, I met a few friends from school and we were able to make an esports community. And we connected with people out of state for us to be able to communicate and also, um, I guess, connect with other people. And for me, gaming actually supports a more overall balanced mental health for students by alleviating anxiety and depression and also increasing socialization skills and enhancing learning. And this is an area that I feel strongly about since during the pandemic. Um, I'm sure for a lot of people, it took a really big toll on people's mental health. That makes sense. Um, and then Menrup, would you wanna maybe explore a little bit more about your work on FriendMe and like what you see as kind of like your vision for the future with the platform? And then if you have any thoughts on what anyone else has had to say that that could happen as well. Sure, so kind of just to touch base on what I touched on originally, um, like when you think of platforms to find help you find new people near you, you think of the, the Tinders, the Bumbles, the meetups, and those are fine, but at the end of the day, those are like physical appearance type platforms. It's like pretty much you think the person is attractive, you swipe right, you think the other option, you swipe left. And that's not like really like a good way of finding new people. And if anything, that's what causes like those type of like anxiety, depression, because you can't control your physical appearance, but like your intrinsic things like your personality or those other types of traits you can control. Um, but it's hard to like talk about that with people that, you know, that's on a physical appearance application. So like with friend me, um, we essentially like people that, as I mentioned, like are going through similar type of things, like it's a niche now, it's more of like mental health people is who we're like helping specifically with it. Um, and so ideally even like more specific is that it, it's a similar platform to like Tinder and the Bumble, but like in the sense it could be used wherever you go, but it's for mental health specific. It's not for like finding new people like dating or whatever. Um, so yeah. So what was the other question you had? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to touch on that. Yeah, kind of just like, I mean, you kind of got into it, but it was like more of like your vision for how people should connect or could connect in the future. For sure. So I would say I ideally want to see Friend Me be like a social platform, but like where it's comfortable to talk about mental health, you know, because as mentioned, it's a, it's a growing problem that people don't really like to talk about. They feel shy talking about it. And so you, we need to make it a lot more like easy to talk. About. So that's why the first step is to talk about it with people that are going through it or have gone through it. Because, you know, if you go to your school counseling or like other places, like they, they won't really know the specific stuff you're feeling or going through compared to someone that's already gone through it in a similar age, because, you know, similar demographics have the similar situations. So uh, that, that's really the vision I see is trying to connect like-minded people uh, on a central problem and just trying to help each other out wherever you go. So, yeah, I don't want to like take up too much time. No, thank you. Thank you for, for your response there, Manroop. Um, we've had some questions from the audience. The first one is about social media. So someone anonymously asked, 
uh, explained that they use social media to get a relief from their personal problems. And they have a question for the panel about whether we think that using social media to take a break from daily life issues and exhaustion is a good idea, like watching YouTube or something like that. Does, is anyone, is it, are any of y'all interested in answering this question? Yeah, um, I think using social media to take a break um, is helpful, but you know, you sometimes have to have, um, I guess, what's the word? Like a cut on yourself. Like you need to make sure that you don't be on social media for a long time. Like for example, if you're on TikTok and you just want to be on there for maybe about five minutes, it's just, it goes on forever and forever. And then next thing you know, it can become an addiction or something that you're not aware of. So I think you should always have um, a limit on yourself whenever you go on social media and you want to take a break. Um, to add to that, I think it's a little hard to separate social media from like, uh, well, I guess I'll say it this way, but like, I remember when I first got like an Instagram and things like that, it was very much just like individual connections. But now with a lot of like advocacy happen happening on um, social media platforms and just like a lot of news being shared, I think at times it's important to recognize for yourself whether that's something that you want to engage in or not. Um, and it very much depends on the circles that you have. Um, but I know like personally, sometimes I do want to use it as a break, but then I kind of like open it up and I'm seeing all of these kind of shitty things happening in the world. Um, and it's not necessarily as much of a mental break as I wanted it to be. Um, so it, it depends on how you manage that, I think. Thank you, Hannah. That's, that's an important point about how like social media could be a break. I mean, Jada as well, but often when you use it too, you know, too much for too long and you're seeing maybe a lot of content that doesn't actually make you feel better, it doesn't really serve as the break that it's meant to be. Um, so thank you both for your contributions there. Um, another question we had from Julie actually was for Jada about um, kind of your experience of gaming. Like, do you think it was your ability to speak and hear fellow gamers voices that made your experience better or was it actually like playing the game itself so maybe tell us a little bit more about your experience with gaming and how it helps i think overall it was actually both because um a lot of gamers actually communicate while gaming so i think it kind of contributed to both of them um being able to hear other people's voices because I was online school, it wasn't in person because of the pandemic. So, you know, like just that um, feeling of missing, you know, how people talk and communicate. And I guess the game overall was better too, but you know, sometimes it could have got addicting. So I had to, you know, put a timer on myself to make sure it wouldn't go over here. That makes sense. Yeah, Jada, that's great to hear. Um... We had another kind of comment from the, the attendees about how, about the importance of intentionality, how like it, it, the quote is intentionality, intentionality is very important. If we're intentional with our social media use, it becomes exponentially more useful. Um, do y'all have any thoughts on like how maybe digital platform or like how we can be more intentional as people, maybe in the context of you know, like mobile applications, social media, or just like, what do you all think about intentionality as maybe a concept or a philosophy? Anyone is kind of welcome to, to speak. I guess I did have a question then. So like regarding intentional, like, is it more, could are you able to like touch a little bit more on that specific like intentional like, and what means? Yeah, so like maybe an example could be like, you're just getting on social media, like an Instagram, just to like scroll and see what people are up to. But like, like you said, Manrup, like maybe you have an intention of actually like connecting with people. So like maybe an example would be like, someone could use friend me because they're more intentionally interested in like actually having like a, a good conversation with someone rather than just like checking. Sure. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. That's like, that's kind of why we're like, with friend be specific, like we're focused on just one specific group is mental health because um, you know, that's a growing problem. And so like, if you go on that specific platform to like solve or like talk with people with that specific need, 
it helps you be a lot more successful rather than like you doing a bunch of different things at once you know it's like your intention you have is if you go in front of me you want to like find people that have gone through this stuff or are currently going through a similar age similar demographic based on like the inputs you put in wherever you go and it can be used whenever you want so um yeah so i, I agree with that and then like some some also ask like what's the difference between this versus like a therapist or like you know the reddit and those type the thing is like those are people that are outside of your age range and so like they don't have like these you know uh, i would say like the consistent like they don't have the viewpoint the perspective that you're currently in um and so like as, especially with college students they really have like a problem with mental health trying to connect them all based on like a similar problem they all have I think that's very important. So, yeah, that's like their intention is is, is not as much to like scroll on Instagram, um, but rather to focus on like a mental problem that everyone could potentially be that. So, thanks, Manu. Appreciate you. Appreciate that response, um, Hannah. We had a question for you from Kathy Holmes about how you're you know you're interested in going to medical school after I guess your graduate school. Um, the question was, does your awareness of mental health issues make you want to incorporate that awareness into the medical practice? And maybe just like a bit more about the connection between mental health and like practicing medicine. Yeah, um, I think one of the baseline assumptions to have um, before I answer that question is that mental health is becoming more of a approachable topic. I think more people are talking about it and that makes it a little bit easier to actually maintain an awareness and kind of um, make sure that it is being addressed. Um, and so the example that I'll give is um, I was also in like a direct medical program. So like my bachelor's is connected to my med degree. Um, but so one of the things that I did was when I started looking at mental health, um, like burnout rates for students that are pre-med, especially students that are in like a kind of guaranteed medical program. Um, and so I did kind of like talk to the director of our program and talk about um, some of like the mental health interventions that we needed. And then they did um, implement some of that. So like they did have a symposium where they kind of forced us all to like sit there and watch and talk about kind of like what our needs were um, and how to meet them individually and also as a community. Um, and then kind of moving forward, going into practice, I think the one way to keep awareness of that is genuinely to just practice care in a way that is interdisciplinary. So um, recognizing that, well, okay, so I, I wanna go into women's health, but recognizing that any patient that comes in um, to see me in the, in a future like that um, is also kind of, uh, an entity or being of health that needs to be addressed in different ways. Um, so ensuring that your care is kind of like grounded and understanding of them as a whole. Um, I think holistic care is usually the word that people use. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think I would incorporate it in the sense of like being a compassionate provider rather than like an all-knowing provider. Like it's, you're never gonna have all the answers, but you can at least kind of make that connection um, with people. That makes a lot of sense. And that's interesting where I think like the traditional relationship between let's say like the patient and the doctor is like the doctor knows everything and like the patient is kind of just there to like receive medical expertise. But Hannah, what, what you're kind of saying is that like the doctor can be more focused on like compassion and understanding and like really trying to, un you know, like ascertain the patient's experience so they, their care can be like maybe more personalized. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, uh, you want the patient to have agency in their own care. But like you said, the traditional power dynamic is that a physician knows what they're doing. Um, but at the end of the day, the patient is kind of the one person that knows what might be best for them. For sure. Thank you. Um, the next question we had was about maybe like the general connection between digital solutions and healthcare as an industry, where healthcare as an industry is becoming a lot more advanced and innovative as a result of like technological solutions. And, but like mental health services specifically have 
you know, been a little bit more regressive. I guess like, does do any of you have maybe more thoughts on how like tech-based solutions or digital solutions can be useful in terms of, you know, improving like the healthcare industry or like the mental health industry as a whole? Maybe like a broader societal question than like a specific solution. Manru? For sure, yeah. So I guess I'll give like a personal example then. Um, so like my mom, she's recently been dealing with some like mental issues and those type of things. So, you know, ideal thing would be to like find a counselor or a therapist, but it's like a six to seven month wait time just to even see someone like that here. Um, and, you know, that's had a doctor like for new patients. And that's also, you know, extended wait times, uh, you know, not they don't not all insurances are accepted. So that's also out of pocket right through those like two hundred dollar visits. Um, so, you know, with people you know, high rising healthcare costs and extended wait times, you know, people dealing with these mental health problems, they don't really have, you know, the time to be really just waiting for it. They need immediate solutions. And so that's why, especially with friend me, like you can find someone near you going through the similar problem anytime, anywhere. And so that's why if you're going to use social media, which is, you know, billions of people do, you might as well use it to help you with the problem that you actually have, you know. Yeah. And so that's why I think, especially with the tech, the tech side of things, it helps you. Um, it's a lot more easy to use it. You know, you don't have to wait for something. It's immediate. Plus, it's free. You know, that's that's definitely something very important too. Um, and you get to talk with like-minded, like-age people. So, I think these type of things, like technology incorporating, that helps just you know reduce wait times provide more resources to a lot more people um, and you know, it's cost efficient, so. Yeah, yeah thank you, uh, Manru. Sorry. I no, think, I, <laughs> uh, I think also one of the most difficult things about this space is also the policies that guide it. Um, so like an example is if you do engage in therapy um, and you're kind of using a telehealth means, if you're a resident of Illinois and you are getting, um, your therapist is also in Illinois, if you were to leave state lines, like say move away for college or move for a job, um, you technically wouldn't be allowed to see that same therapist because um, they're kind of given their credentials within like a state um, by, the, by the state. Um, and so it's policies like that that kind of mitigate any of the benefit that digital solutions can have. Um, so I think it's really important to understand like the legal landscape of it as well um, and kind of advocate for more, um, for, for policies that are better fit for people, right? So there is an example of another um, article that I read the other day that was essentially about how Facebook collects so much data, obviously. Um, about social media usage and whatnot. But um, essentially the article was positing that if Facebook was to be integrated, the data that they covered was to be integrated with like HIPAA laws, then there's a lot more research that could be done because Facebook has been shown to essentially um, predict someone's like mental affect or mood affect almost like three months before um, any like professional help is sought. So having access to that information in a way that is, again, HIPAA compliant, but also making use of the fact that that is a wealth of knowledge that we have um, is something that requires a lot of like policy advocacy too, um, because you need to kind of encourage people that this is a safe use of their information and all of these things. Um, and I think I think that's why mental health solutions have lagged behind a little bit is because in the digital space and also in the mental health space, that is two very abstract spaces that are kind of trying to be legislated and trying to be moved forward. So it makes people afraid um, of kind of what those changes might be. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Jada, you said you'd like to speak. What would you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, this is a question for Manru. Um, is Friendly free? And if so, like what type of platforms are they on? So it is free right now. And since, you know, making an app costs like 40, 50,000 minimum, you know, that's obviously a lot to put up at once. Um, 
we're right now just available on web right now. So if you go to thefriendme.com, um, you'll find it there. And so we actually, I was talking with Sina about this is that we were going on a more specific niche now before it was more like similar interest, which, you know, that, that's a bit broad. But now we're like, as of recent, just a couple of days ago, I spoke with some people. And so we're focused more on the mental health side specific. So we need to implement that on the website, but um, it is website right now because you know, it, it's you know, a lot more cost efficient. But then we do have two student developers that are working on the app right now. And so that, that'll help with like the mobile version of things. It's a lot easier. To use, but it is free, so. All right, thank um, we had another question for you, Manroop, in the chat. So it was from Kathy again, and she was asking, like, how do you direct someone that uses FriendMe that is, you know, facing a mental health crisis to, um, yeah, but because access to professional care is difficult to find, like, where do you kind of direct someone that's using FriendMe for mental health purposes that is dealing with a mental health crisis? So are you able to, like, elaborate a little bit more on the question? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think like the question is that, you know, it, there's a lot of value in peer support, right? Like being sure. able to connect with people that are struggling with similar mental illnesses. Um, but if someone is dealing with like a mental health crisis, you know, like something that's more acute, um, like what is kind of the solution for them? Like how can they access, you know, like more professional care beyond friendly? For sure. So besides the, you know, the one-on-one -on -one conversation aspect of talking with someone that's like gone through it in a similar age range, they'll give you some solutions too of like, you know, um, this is what I did. Since I, I'm not really like a huge advocate for medicines, like using medicines for mental, because that's, you're kind of dependent on the medication. And, you know, you, you want to use natural solutions, whether it's like counseling or those type of things. Um, so to touch on the question then, it's it's more of um, accessing professional care then, like in a crisis. I would say then like the platform right now, we're focused on one-on-one -on -one and like connecting you with people who like, they'll give you solution. Like this is what I did when I was going through it. And then you can go based off of that because it's a lot more of an organic thing. Like you'll have a lot more like you know, similarity when talking about it rather than you know, go to a therapist, but I have to wait six months, pay $200 for, you know, basic advice you can get on the internet. You know, it's a lot more authentic when you're talking with similar age people on a, on a similar problems. Thanks, Manroop. Uh, Hannah, you, you said you had a question for Manroop. Yeah. Um, so kind of for some context in the beginning phases of our, um, like student mental health coalition, our initial idea was to integrate um, a mental health platform within like the school's app. Um, so we wanted to have like bystander interventions. We kind of wanted to have um, like a hotline, but like over text so that it was a little bit more discreet than like the phone hotline that our school offers. Um, but the biggest issue that we ran into was um, this idea of liability in the same, um, way of like if someone were actually having like an acute mental health crisis and this app didn't necessarily serve their needs or didn't assist them in the correct way then that could be a huge liability issue um so essentially when we, i was wondering if liability and legality of your app is something that you've dealt with or had to kind of comb through not as of recent because we've had about 60 people that have used it so far and so it's more of just like a conversational just like venting in a way it's not really like you know this is what i would like medicine wise like hey you should go and buy this medicine you know it's not as much of that but it's more just being able to talk about is what we're kind of focused on because you know it's a sensitive topic a lot of people they don't they keep that to themselves and the problem just keeps growing and growing so we're trying to you know, if people are going to use social media, which, you know, it's tough to get them off of that, they might as well use it towards like a problem that we're solving, making it comfortable to talk about, you know, something like this. Um, so, yeah. And so like regarding liability wise of things, since they're not like giving like specific like medical advice. So that's another thing too, is that 
as of right now, since it isn't testing, a lot of the chats are monitors. So we're able to see like what they're saying specifically. And so we'll probably have something like that in there too, is that if we see someone is saying some adverse things, we'll put in restrictions. You know, that we, don't, we don't want negativity to be on a platform. You know, so liability wise, we probably have some sort of disclosure agreement before like starting it that if, if you say something of this, you can be removed off the platform since we don't want to be in that type of field where we get in trouble for trying to help people, you know, because someone comes in and says something. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's not necessarily about like adversity so much as it is like um, scenario, like say that I'm considering like harming myself and I were to say that on this platform, kind of like what are the pieces in play that kind of make sure that I get the care that I need and kind of don't, yeah. Um, or are there any, is that something that you've had to think about? Um, for sure. Cause that was the biggest so, question that they had for us. Um, but I think that came from the fact that we were going through the university, it wasn't necessarily independent. For sure. So I actually probably should touch on this. So part of Friend Me, we have a newsletter. It's currently, it's right now, it's just monthly. It's called the Friendship Focus. Um, so we do talk about solutions like that. Like here are some natural things you could do when you're having a mental crisis and like when you're by yourself too. Um, so I think like re having resources, free resources like that um, for these specific age group, age group users, I think that would help a lot because, you know, those are just what we would recommend. It's not like what we're requiring them to do. So, yeah, thanks, Manroop. And uh, as Susan said, I I definitely can kind of share some light on this issue as well. So, Unmasked is definitely somewhat of a similar platform to FriendMe in the sense that it's a digitally focused mental health community. Um, we also have like a free application, a mobile application, which is on iOS and Android. We have about twelve thousand student users across forty six universities and we've started we've partnered with a few colleges and universities in like a paid partnership contract so I definitely have some insight into like how liability works in the context of like a digital peer support platform so I can kind of clarify um, if that would be helpful so the way we kind of manage liability on Unmasked is we have about we have a pretty big team of about 500 student volunteers they take shifts every day and they're kind of actively monitoring the platform for flagged content. So we also have like supervision in the form of a senior moderation team. So that's, those are all students with experience, you know, like training in crisis intervention, at least 30 hours of training. So Hannah, if you like posted, like I'm thinking about hurting myself, suicide, anything like that, we have a safety alert system. So all of the moderators on shift receive safety alerts that kind of let them know that they should check the app and review that post that post would be removed from the platform in the sense that we don't want to risk a student in crisis like receiving potentially malicious advice from someone else or just like having a bad experience then the senior moderator would take over that conversation one-on-one -on -one with you and we follow we've modeled our kind of crisis escalation policy off of crisis text lines approach to like these kinds of imminent risk scenarios and the process is very much like risk assessment like making sure that the person's okay but understanding um like their risk to themselves like are they about to die is it like imminent is it you know like means plans protocol that kind of thing and the idea is that if someone is at like imminent risk of dying then like you'd have to kind of call in authorities and make sure that like they're okay and like the worst case scenario is involuntary hospitalization but so i'm like the head of our senior moderation team we've had probably like 400 posts about suicide self-harm and we've only had one like data turnover event where we've had to like direct someone from, you know, unmask the platform to like actual like authorities. And I think a big part of working with college administrations is making sure that like campus police, like campus security is involved rather than like the actual police, just because campus security often like employs like nonviolent means of kind of working with a student. They're a lot more familiar with the student's background. Um, so like a big thing that I've worked on, like kind of as like a political advocacy point is making sure that all campus securities at universities Unmasked operates at, like has experience in mental health crisis intervention training, 
as well as just like making sure that they're like employing like a nonviolent approach to like, you know, transporting someone to like the hospital or something like that. Yeah, Hannah, is that is that helpful? Yeah, very much so. Cool. Um, I think the next question was for Jada about uh, Kathy was hoping you could talk a little bit more about your story and how social media has or social media has helped you through your ACL recovery. Hoping to hear, you know, like the value of gaming and social media for helping you with recovery. I think a few ways that social media has helped me through my ACL surgery, as I spoke on recently, was about making new friends and building a community. But not only that, but just being able to socialize. Because, you know, when you need someone to talk to, especially when you have mental health challenges, it's really important for, you know, you to be able to express how you feel with other people. And um, I guess another way that social media has really helped me was being able to, like, to watch other videos of people, like, with my ACL surgery, that I'm not alone. Because I think a lot of people need to realize that, especially when they're athletes, that whenever they get injured, you know, it can feel like the worst thing possible because you're not able to do what you love most. But I think being able to relate and see that I'm not the only person going through it really helped. Thank you, Jada. I think that's kind of like one of the broader points from this panel is the like the importance of not feeling like you're alone when you're struggling and like maybe how digital platforms can kind of give us access to other people just because it can be really hard, you know, in person to have those kinds of conversations and realize that everyone is struggling with some, you know, similar things that you've struggled with. Um, yeah, let's see. We kind of have a few last minute, uh, like a few minutes left of the panel because um, it's 1142. I think we're supposed to wrap it. 1145 is, you know, we, we've had a lot of questions, a lot of discussion, and it's all been really interesting. Do any of the panelists want to just kind of add a little bit more, have any more thoughts on like, a lot of the questions that have been said. Does anyone want to speak? Okay, so maybe we have a suggestion. Maybe everyone could have one last recommendation. I guess the, this could be a little, maybe a little broad, but you know, maybe like your goals for the future, um, recommendations for the audience, like what you think should happen in the context of digital mental health. Yeah, for sure. So that's a great question. So in essence, I would say that, you know, using social media, it has its pros if you use it in the right way. You know, like I personally, I use it more to read the news. And there are some apps out there that they show you positive news. So like, you know, why read negative news to start the day off? You know, um, like there are some apps out there that show you only positive things. And, you know, th that's usually what I like to read. Uh, because it is important to still know what's going on around you. But I would say just like using it to learn is, is really important. I, I personally don't really like using social media that much, but because of friend me, I've had to like, you know, use Instagram and those just for promotion of those type of things. So I would say as long as you're using it in the right way, it's important. Use it for specific reasons. Not as much of like go on Instagram to see you know, like oh, someone's on vacation or something, you know, because because that also like in your subconscious that like it's like a comparison type thing. Like, why is he in this position? Why am I not in that? You know, like and that that's not really, you know, ideal to do. So I would say using social media uh, in the right way where you'll actually learn and positively like get something out of it is important. So I think especially with what you're doing with Unmasked and with what I'm doing with Friendly, it's very important. It's like we're helping people towards something that's actually gonna help them in the long term with their mental health because um, you know, not discussing the problem is just gonna lead to it growing and growing and growing. And it's it's just gonna deteriorate, like it's caused like physical health deterioration over time. So I think identifying the problem early and focusing on finding a solution is important. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with everyone. Thank you, Manru. We're very glad we were able to hear from you as well. And yeah, thank you. Thank you to Susan and Julie for hosting this panel. And all of this has been really great. Um, Jada, Hannah, do, do you all have any like maybe final words and maybe like what you've learned in summary? 
Um, I'll kind of go with like your goals question. Um, I think a, a big goal that I have is to kind of um, have universities be more comfortable in the digital space. Like I know UIC's Counseling Center website is abysmal to say the least. Um, and there is so much potential there as long as someone is kind of like willing to make those changes and not be necessarily held back by all the potential repercussions because the potential for good is so much more. Um, so yeah, a goal is to kind of just get more comfortable in the space and get more people to buy into it. Cool, thanks Hannah. Um, Jada, do you wanna give your last thoughts and then we can wrap yeah. up? Um, I guess one big goal is to be different in a positive way towards the community game. I mean, the gaming community because it could be really toxic sometimes you know like people can make hateful or rude comments and sometimes people think you know it's just a joke but in the inside it can really hurt someone so I think just being a role model towards people that um can get hate comments a lot or maybe um different disabilities towards them I think it's really important to you know show them care and love and to just show them that they're not alone. Definitely. Thank you, Jada. Appreciate everyone on this panel for all of your wise and insightful thoughts. It's been really nice to have like this interesting conversation on a Sunday morning. But yeah, I think we're I think we're good to go. And you know, if anyone's interested in reaching out to anyone on the panel, I think Susan and Julie have like made our contact information available if anyone wants to kind of continue these conversations. But thank you again to everyone that came to the panel to participate as well as to listen and engage in this really important conversation. Um, have a good rest of your day, everyone. It's good to see you all today. Thank you, you as well. Have a good weekend. Bye, guys.